Uh, gentlemen, uh, welcome uh, that you came to the Netherlands to inform the Dutch public about the UFO phenomenon. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to introduce you all. I would like to start with you, Jaime Mossam from Mexico City. You are an expert on this uh, phenomenon. And Mr. Stanton Friedman, you are a physicist and from the scientific point of view, we hope to get lots and lots of information also from you. And Mr. Sitchin, thank you very much for being here thank with you. us as well. We have given the program a certain name, and the name is, which I took from this, this book by um, your colleague Alan Hynek, you know the book, yes. I suppose, On the Edge of Reality. He says at the end of the book, when we solve, the UFO problem, we will make a big step, a gigantic leap in our evolution. So that's a big step in our evolution, that's the theme of our being here together. Maybe concerning the, um, the theme, I would like to ask you, uh, uh, Mr. Massan, uh, what is your opinion on the statement I just made? Uh, I think this is the, I am a journalist, I am a TV journalist, I've been working as an investigative reporter for the last 30 years, and in 1991, when I got involved uh, with this phenomenon, I thought I had the opportunity to present the biggest news ever in the history of mankind, and it's exactly what you are saying that Mr. Hynek told us uh, many years ago. We, are, we have here a phenomenon that is of great importance for human beings because after we accept this, we are gonna have to change. We are going to have to develop because it would prove that it's possible to travel faster than the speed of light. And that's what it's all about. I don't care if these beings are good or evil all I care is that with their presence here, they are proving that it's possible to go from one planet to the next. And it means also that we have a responsibility with the next generations. Right. Mr. Friedman, what's your opinion about the, the statement? Well, Alan was a very conservative, Alan Hynek was a very yeah. conservative uh, astronomer. He kind of apologized for dealing with flying saucers. I'm a nuclear physicist who's worked on far out propulsion systems. I don't think we need to go faster than the speed of light. Just use nuclear fusion or whatever. But I've reached four major conclusions about flying saucers after 42 years of study. Um, first, that the evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. In other words, some UFOs are alien spacecraft. Most are not. I don't care about them. Second, we're dealing with a kind of cosmic Watergate, meaning some few people within major governments have known since July 1947 at least when they recovered two crash flying saucers in New Mexico in the United States with bodies and wreckage, that indeed some UFOs are alien spacecraft. Third, none of the arguments made against the first two conclusions by a small group of UFO debunkers, if you will, including my University of Chicago classmate Carl Sagan, none of their arguments stand up. They sound great until you look at the evidence and they collapse of their own weight. And finally, fourth, we are indeed dealing with the most important story of the past millennium. Visits to planet Earth by alien spacecraft, successful cover-up of the best data, bodies and wreckage, for 53 years. That has all kinds of implications for the future of mankind, for our grandchildren, if you will. Learning that we're not alone in the universe, that we're not the big shots in the neighborhood. These are very, and, and that governments can keep secrets for that long. These are very significant conclusions. So, Mr. Sitchin, uh, you are a historian. You have studied uh, the, the, the Sumerian clay tablets, yes. and you wrote some wonderful books, and also a few of those books have been translated into the Dutch right. language. Three of them. Four. <laughs> Here is the other one. There is one more. And yeah. uh, you have studied this whole subject from the beginning of mankind. What's your opinion about a big step in our evolution? Well, uh, to take off from where my uh, two friends here uh, 
uh, made their points. Uh, the first thing <clears throat> that is important to realize is that uh, the so-called UFO phenomenon or the possible uh, uh, is others say alien spacecraft or alien visits is not a new phenomenon. It's not a phenomenon that began in modern times, even uh, in, in the past, just past century or in the millennium. Uh, this goes back almost half a million years. And uh, indeed, uh, in, in my talk on Sunday, I, I will include now that uh, the subject came up, I, I include depictions of UFOs uh, from cave art from 25 and 30,000 years ago. Right. But the ones who really uh, left us a legacy of information, both pictorial and, and textual in written text, are the Sumerians, the first uh, known civilization that uh, blossomed out uh, in what is today Iraq about 6,000 years ago. And not only did they uh, submit and record and left behind for reporters. I, 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 I'm more a reporter than a historian because I think I'm able to report to people today what was known and evidenced and experienced the thousands of years ago. And what they say is that uh, not only that Earth has been visited repeatedly, but they identified the source of the home planet, let's call it, from which the people uh, who operated those spacecraft have come. And uh, second, they uh, made it clear, not only that we are not alone in the immense universe, which uh, the most uh, doubting uh, person would say, okay, uh, mathematically it's possible that with so many uh, billions of suns and, and, uh, and galaxies there could be a solar system and maybe life evolved, but that there is one more planet in our own solar system that comes to our vicinity roughly every 3600 years and it is during those times that intelligent beings far more advanced than us capable of traveling in space some half a million years ago started to come and go between their planet and our planet so it's not only that we are not alone in our own solar system but that those who came here were directly involved in bringing us about through genetic engineering by manipulating genetically the hominids who have evolved on Earth through evolution to bring them up to look like them and think like them and being able to learn from them. So the UFO phenomenon, in my opinion, if it is put in the context of ancient times, Right. is the, bo the best corroborating evidence for the veracity of the Bible. The planet you were talking about, is that the 12th planet? Well, technically, it is the, a 10th planet, one more beyond Pluto, which is, according to the Sumerians, the 12th member of the Both solar members. system. Sun, moon, and 10 planets. So when my first book was published, and I mentioned that it was, uh, a quarter of a century ago, and it is becoming more and more a classic taught at colleges and universities by now, the publisher said a title that would say the 10th planet, which is the 12th member. Right. Let's call it the 12th planet. Let's call so it. as a planet, it's the 10th. As a member of the solar system, it's the 12th. In uh, October 27, 1992, someone was recording this object that is strange by itself when he realized that over his head he had something like 18 spheres. They were moving all together. As you see, but they never lose the formation. Even if they move, the formation remains the same. They are moving, they are advancing again. They are passing over, they are not going up. No, they are going parallel to the ground. The camera is to the scene. And then you can see this object releasing one of these spheres here. On October 
1994, we had more than 30 spheres, but now they are standing still. I don't know if any skeptical has an explanation for this. They don't move, and they make figures. They make triangles, as you see. This is daytime. This is 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And this was the first video we received with this kind of event, because up just six weeks later, we received this video from a different uh, state, Tamaulipas again. And you see they, they make a figure. It's like the crop circles, but in the sky. Mr. Massan, your country is the country where, at the moment, we see the, the most sightings of, of UFOs of all the countries all over the world. Do you think, uh, and we would like you to show some of your pictures and give us the latest information about the latest uh, uh, sightings, um, do you think that there is a relation between uh, the, the pyramids, who are those very old buildings like we, you have studied them as well, mm -hmm. I suppose, is there a relationship between the mathematics of the pyramid and the UFO phenomenon? To tell you the truth, uh, I don't know, but I think uh, I can speculate on it because, as you mentioned, Mexico has more, more than 100,000 sites of ruins. Probably is the country with most pyramids in the world. And now is the country with more sightings in the world. As Zakaria said a little bit ago, uh, that uh, must be a relation of these two things. I mean, if you have all cultures, all legacies, and if they are coming back according to all prophecies, because there are prophecies around this. After the eclipse of July 11, 1991, we discovered that in the Dresde Codex, they said more than a thousand years ago that after this eclipse would be the time of the meeting with the masters of the stars. And probably Zachariah can join this. There are other possibilities, of course. The volcanoes, we have many active volcanoes, and many, many sightings are around volcanoes, especially when they are very active. We have discovered that every time we have a, 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 an important sighting close to the volcano Popocatépetl, we are going to have an eruption. And people know that now. I, if we have this sighting and it's presented in television, everybody takes care of that because something is going to happen. For example, December uh, 17th, 1998, at 7 o'clock in the morning, the television in Mexico City with the helicopter, the traffic helicopter, got a, a very spectacular object close to the volcano. And then I went to the radio and television and said, we have to be careful because this is preceding probably an eruption. That same night, we had a big explosion of this terrible volcano, probably the most dangerous volcano in the world. Why? Because it's very explosive and because probably there are more than 30 to 40 million people living close to this volcano, around 100 kilometers. It means that it, it really explodes this could be the worst uh, tra tragedy ever in the history of mankind. That's another possibility. Mexico is also a country of many mountains. Uh, probably they use some energy in the mountains or some energy from volcanoes. In 1996, there was a team from the Bergen University from Norway, from the Discovery Channel, and from the BBC in England. They went close to the volcano. They used a special machine and they were able to obtain uh, the information of magnetism under the volcano. And they found, of this Popocatépetl, they found that there was more energy there than anywhere else in the world. Is that a possibility? Probable. But also the, the legacy and the, and the past, as you see, is pure speculation because I don't have any contacts with them, I don't drink with them, uh, they don't tell me anything, you know, and then I have just to speculate. But the real thing is that, yes, we have very important sightings. Now, on uh, September 1991, uh, from the Discovery Shuttle, 
They were able to record this coming out of the earth. What is it? This is coming from inside the earth and going outside the earth. And yes, the astronaut is interested in this object. What is it? It is like transparent, like plasma, or organic, and empty. You remember this one recorded on the 27th of October 1992. What is this? And what is this making in Mexico City? The altitude is very high. This is probably 15,000 meters. You see, and you can see how some objects are coming out of it, like the, the little spheres. And this is like organic. What is that? This is from Salida, Colorado, 27 of August, 1995. Same kind of object. Well, somebody was recording this object uh, that doesn't say so much, but suddenly he realized that up in the sky, in the middle of a cloud, there is an object hiding. Like it wasn't, it didn't want to be seen. You see how this object moves. Now it's like a sphere. And now it's going to be, again, a large object. I don't know what to say. These are, looks to be organic or... And we have many, many videos of these kind of objects or things or whatever they are. What are they? <laughs> more and more videos, probably good, probably bad, but many of them unexplainable. What is this? Hover over Mexico City. In this object, you see these three kind of movements. One is left to right, the other is hovering, and the other is rotating. You see all the details from the video, everything tells me that it's right. Again, the first time I saw it, I thought this was a hoax. Because when something is so clear, it's not, nothing in the middle. Either this is a hoax, or is the, is, this is the thing. If this video is real, then we have to accept this phenomenon is real. There is no, nothing in the middle. Then, that's why this man didn't come out into the open. Because we are not ready yet to accept something like this. Then what would happen to him? He would have been destroyed completely. Completely. Otherwise, we would have to accept the video. And if we are not going to do that, it's very dangerous now to do it. If you have something that is nothing in the middle, cannot be said, well, it's a balloon, well, something else. And it's so clear, you could be destroyed. And let me tell you the last event in Mexico City on February 14th, night, uh, year 2000, that's um, a little bit more than a month ago. A UFO came into downtown Mexico, 2.20 in the morning in the Friendship Day, we call it the Friendship UFO, you know. And this object came just three meters from the ground, 
it was surrounded by police, it was in the radio frequency, some reporters that were in jail covering a very spectacular case in Mexico go to the place, seven different reporters from radio, television, and five of the most important papers, and all of them saw this UFO there, clearly, and then they saw how this UFO went around Mexico City for one hour and then disappeared. Next morning, everyone in Mexico was wondering what had happened, even the most skepticals. Uh, some journalists that have, you know, been joking around the phenomenon, now they were asking, what is happening in Mexico? It seems that Mr. Maussan was right from the beginning. Let me show you some of these very spectacular pictures that have been obtained very recently. As, as this set, this picture was obtained on August 28th, uh, 1999, in the north area of Mexico, where very close to where this uh, sighting of uh, February 14th was. We have, these photographs are so spectacular because they were taken by a professional photographer. What happened, many times we have your videos that are not very nice or pictures that are very far away, but what happened with a, when a professional with a great camera, a great lens, 500 millimeters, 1000 millimeters, takes the pictures with the right film, this is the result. The result is spectacular. This UFO was uh, 3,000 meters from the ground, it was just a little red dot. But with the right equipment, you have a spectacular pictures. Uh, we were lucky because there, uh, not many times we have this kind of uh, photographers behind this kind of events. But now this is the result. And now many other photographers, professional photographers in Mexico City are getting involved with this, uh, with this phenomenon. But as you see, the pictures reveal that this is a solid object with some kind of plasma in the bottom. And here you can see the movement of this object. You can see how it's rotating. And for me, it's some of the most uh, spectacular, unbelievable, because this is a very believable subject. And this is just an example of what is happening in my country. The way uh, the phenomenon takes place right now, the UFO phenomenon in Mexico, that uh, they seem to, to make us known, we are here, and don't be afraid. Is, yeah, is that true well, what I said? The Mexico, let me tell you, on January 1st, 1993, there were hundreds of uh, spheres around Mexico City. People came into the streets, stopped the highways. Remember, Mexico City is like Los Angeles, big highways, a lot of traffic in the streets. Everything is stopped for two hours in the city to watch UFOs. And people were celebrating, you know, they were coming, they were calling them, come, you know, we are ready to, for this so-called contact or whatever. I mean, this is real, it's true, it wasn't the news, all the news. And probably it's another reason why they are so close to us. I think it has to be something related to the past, it has to be a legacy with this all culture. These, there were the, these were the watchers of the, of the stars. They like to watch the sky every night. That's why they build these pyramids, to, to be able to, to, to put the position of the planets, to follow them. Um, probably they were able to watch more than anybody else in the past these objects as the other cultures, Sumerians, Egyptians, uh, and so forth. Uh, then, yes, Mexico is a country that is ready. In my country, here I know oh, many skepticals, we don't know, we haven't seen something. But in Mexico, all the pilots, the people from the Tower of Control are saying, this is true, this is happening. Just on February 18th, the year 2000, in Merida, southeast Mexico, the Tower of Control of the airport reported 200 objects and they were really worried because they were very close to the airplanes that were landing in that place. Uh, a week ago, we made a program uh, with Christina in the United States, uh, and one of the guests was a controller, a, a representative of the controllers, a, a, a union man. And he said, we 
have to ask the government in Mexico to recognize this phenomenon because we are really worried for the security of the airplanes in Mexico. These objects come very close, as you see in some of these pictures. Mm -hmm. They come very close to airplanes and we are afraid of an accident. Then the controllers officially in Mexico are asking the government to recognize this phenomenon. I mean, this is real and this is the most important thing that is happening in Mexico at this moment. So it seems like their technology is uh, of such quality that they can prevent ac accidents from happening. Uh, is, accidents are true? accidents. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. I think the pilot accidents. does something wrong, you say. Uh, or a par when a pilot does something wrong. <laughs> so now, uh, that they are kind and friendly to us, uh, let me put it that way, is that they express that by, for instance, uh, giving us inf education and information about a volcano maybe erupting. And uh, so I think that's a very good sign. I heard some information a long time ago maybe 40 years ago, that in Egypt it was forbidden that airplanes would fly above the pyramids because it happened that sometimes the engines stalled. Um, do you know about this information? Don't know anything about it. No. That. Uh, so th that's something I already know from 40 years ago. Now we know uh, from the literature about UFOs that in many cases when people sit in a car or on a truck uh, driving on the road that all of a sudden the engine stalls. Uh, can you give us some information well, about this, please? One of the many uh, effects of flying saucers, if you will, I prefer flying saucers because all flying saucers are UFOs. Very few UFOs are flying saucers, and I'm only interested in the ones that are. Uh, one of the many physical effects are automobile stoppages. There are two different reports. One has 400 cases, one has 300 cases on record of car engines and uh, lights and radios and stuff in automobiles going out. A famous case uh, in Texas, level in Texas, where half a dozen motorists reported to the sheriff that their car engine went off and they saw this bright egg-shaped object on the road ahead of them. Half a dozen different people calling the sheriff's department. These were people who didn't know each other. Uh, so it happened there. Dr. James E. McDonald, who was one of the world's top uh, UFO investigators, has interviewed over 500 witnesses. That's a lot of investigation. He checked those cases out. His congressional testimony alone was 71 pages long. He covers 41 sightings. Jim was top notch. Uh, there are similar cases. <laughs> of, I'll call it electromagnetic effects, on aircraft. Dr. Richard Haynes, a scientist retired now from NASA, has collected more than 3,500 pilot sightings. And in at least 200 of these cases, there are effects on systems of the airplane, the compass going wild, communication systems turning off, automatic guidance, you know, a lot of different electromagnetic systems on board an aircraft. Uh, and these are with experienced pilots, military and commercial. So effects on systems, there's a classic case in Italy, two tractors, one a diesel, one a normal tractor, and the normal one stopping and the diesel one just going on. And I like to think of the conversation on board the flying saucer that was near these two vehicles back to the drawing board. Don't they know that this system doesn't work for some of these systems? <laughs> In other words, it, it's interesting. There's a philosophical question here, you see. Uh, our approach, uh, typically an American approach, and I'm an American and a Canadian, so I can be troublesome to both, is shoot first, ask questions later. The aliens very often seems, seem to cause things to stop, including people. In a number of abduction cases, People are controlled, if you will, uh, without being hurt. They're stopped. They can't move. They can breathe. They're still breathing. But that's a, kind of a nice way of preventing somebody from doing something you don't want to do rather than shooting them, which is the American way. So uh, physical effects, a classic case was in Iran, as a matter of fact, 
where the head of the Air Defense Command there was called by a number of people called the airport. They had seen this bright light moving off in the sky. He goes outside and looks and he sees it. He scrambles two aircraft to go after this thing. They go after it, one after the other. Systems go out on the plane, including their weapons control system, which is very devastating to a pilot. You're now weaponless. And uh, other systems go off. They break off the chase. The systems come back on. Now, a very detailed report of this event was made to the Central Intelligence Agency with a distribution list this long in the United States. And this sighting lasted for a good bit of time. Now, there's testimony there from the head of this Iranian Air Defense Command, the general who saw this thing himself. This is not testimony you can throw out. And it certainly was of concern. They were American airplanes being flown by Iranian pilots. Certainly of concern to them if the aircraft systems don't work when you're chasing uh, an intruder. So because if the aliens can do this, maybe somebody else can do this that you don't want to have do it. So effects on aircraft and on vehicles on the ground, tractors, automobiles, whatever, are of considerable importance and should be, understandably, you can understand why this was classified at first. All that, that case was very hard. Somebody worked very hard and got copies of the case. So physical effects, and I need to add one compliment to Jaime. Uh, one of the reasons that we hear so much about the cases in Mexico is because he, as a professional journalist, made a real effort to get facts and data to let people know that he would treat them fairly and squarely. And his articles and his programs have encouraged people to speak out. I check all my audiences. I've given over 700 lectures. I'm giving one uh, Sunday, of course, here. Uh, at all my lectures, I ask at the end of the lecture, how many people here believe they've seen what I would consider to be a flying saucer? The hands go up tentatively. They're worried. Typically, it's 10% of the people. Then I ask, how many of you reported what you saw? 90% of the hands go down. I think in Mexico right now, a much higher percentage of people who see something will report it. And that encourages other people to report it because he has done such a splendid job of making the public aware of what is going on. And that's where the difference comes. If in any country in Europe or in the United States or Canada, a major newsman would treat the subject fairly and honestly and openly and give people an opportunity to report what they have seen, we'd see a huge influx of sightings. Now, I don't know what the press would do with those, but I'm sure it would happen. You, uh, you asked uh, the effects about uh, plane stopping, right. car stopping. What about the earth stopping? Yeah, that's a now. You, your question started with the not all the Mexican pyramids, but the main ones in Teotihuacan, the pyramid of the sun, the pyramid of the moon, and according to the lore and legends connected with their construction, it had to do with a day when the sun failed to rise. The night continued for 20 hours longer than it should have. And I devote a whole chapter to that in my book uh, in, yeah. in English. And you can read in Dutch the title. The, the day that the, the, the sun didn't move. When we say that the sun didn't rise, we actually mean that the earth stopped rotating, right? The interesting thing for me, and I mentioned that the, all this ancient and modern, perhaps, UFO evidence is corroboration of the Bible. Now, we have in the Bible the tale that when the Israelites began the conquest of Canaan, the land of Israel, uh, and there was a time when one of the battles was very difficult and the sun did not set a whole day to enable the Israelites to vanquish the enemy. No one was able until now, not even me, to, to explain what happened. How come the sun failed to set for 20 hours to enable the battle to continue until it was won? And when I came to investigating 
the Americas and Mexico and South America and came across this tale connected with the construction of the two pyramids in Teotihuacan, it dawned on me that they are talking about the same phenomenon, that when the sun did not set on one side of the world, it did not rise on the other side of the world for the same 20 hours. Yeah. The question then was, did this happen at the same time? <clears throat> because we know the time of Joshua, the conquest was around 1400 BC. And it turns out that in South America, <coughs> in the Andes, the same story is found in the local native lore of a day when the sun did not rise until the gods got together and found a solution. So, and that is also dated to about the same time. So your question about the pyramids and <coughs> the stoppage of movement yeah. goes beyond stopping of a car or a plane, perhaps. It goes to a day when the earth stopped rotating and it has to do on one hand with the conquest of Canaan and with the other with that place that you asked about in Mexico called Teotihuacan, yeah. which literally means the city or place of the gods. In my mind came the appearance of Holy Mary in Portugal. And I don't know if you are familiar with the story, but then something happened with the sun. The people saw the sun falling down. Uh, Mr. Friedman, do you see a, a relation between th those uh, events um, uh, Mr. Sitchin just described? Well, I see his connection between Egypt and Mexico, same time, day and night. That's very nice. I don't know what to make. I think you're talking about Fatima, right. the miracle of Fatima. I think that's a story we haven't heard all of. After all, the Vatican has not released no. the, the last predictions from that. I will put that in my gray basket. Not black, not white, maybe. I don't know, in other words. I'm not going to venture an opinion when I don't have enough information. No. Thank you. If, if we are interviewed again in a few weeks, maybe I'll have an answer. Maybe because I'm supposed to have meetings uh, with Vatican people on the subject of extraterrestrials. Something very interesting is happening right now with the Vatican. We have uh, Corrado Balducci, which is a very close man to the Pope. He was member of the Curia in the Vatican. He was a so-called exorcist for many years, official exorcist of the Vatican. And he has been given interviews to anyone who asks to say that the Catholic Church should accept this phenomenon. Because the Catholic Church has to accept the human testimony because it's based, the religion is based on human testimony. <laughs> then they cannot say this is not true and what we believe is true. It's just about the same. And uh, they are changing drastically their position. I think we're going to have a big surprise from the church over the next decade. Can you tell us a little bit, or maybe do you have some a scientific explanation about or what kind of technology the they system. use to, to, to move? Well, I worked on advanced nuclear and space systems for 14 years as a nuclear physicist, classified programs. And the first thing you have to say about going to the stars is you have to select, so where are we going? I prefer to look just at our local neighborhood, within 54 light years of here, just down the street. There are a thousand stars of which 46 are similar to the sun. So I'm not interested in across our galaxy, which is 80,000 light years across. I'm not interested in the next big galaxy over, which is a million light years away. That's a different kind of problem. I'm interested in the local neighborhood. So the place I'm particularly interested in getting to, two stars, which Jaime can see and the rest of us can't, Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli, the constellation of reticulum, 37 light years away that's just down the street. Those two stars are less than a light year apart. They're both sun-like stars, and they're a billion years older than the sun. And recognition of their special characteristics came about because of a very famous UFO sighting where a star map was observed. So that's the first thing. I'm not talking about going to another galaxy or across our own. Secondly, we have to recognize that at one g acceleration, the force of gravity right here now, it takes less 
just about a year to get close to the speed of light. Not a hundred years, not a thousand years, just about one year. Secondly, we have to note that we have already, in America anyway, operated nuclear propulsion systems. A nuclear rocket engine that would fit on this table if it were strong enough, that puts out a power of 4,400 megawatts, twice the power of the old Grand Coulee Dam. That's a lot of energy in a small space. That was operated in the late 1960s. That's nuclear fission, what goes on in nuclear submarines, nuclear power plants. In the early 1960s, I worked on nuclear fusion propulsion system. That's the most important source of energy in all our lives, because the sun up there is a mass of fusioning uh, particles, if you will. It's not a mass of burning gas. It's nuclear fusion is producing the energy. If we use the right things in the right way and kick particles out the back end of a fusion rocket that have 10 million times as much energy per particle as you can get in a chemical rocket. 10 million. Now, this doesn't mean I think aliens use fission or fusion, but only that we know how to do it if you want to spend the money. I'm not saying we should. I think we have other problems to take care of first. The key thing here is Friedman's Law, named by me for me, <laughs> immodestly. And that is that technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. The future is not an extension of the past. You have to change how you do things. Lasers aren't better light bulbs, different physics. Micro-integrated circuits in our computers are not small vacuum tubes. They work by different physics. The nuclear rocket engines are not just better chemical engines. The reason I bring this up, I mentioned zeta-1 and zeta-2 reticuli are a billion years older than the sun. So if somebody out there somewhere got started a little bit before we did on his or her technological kick, they're going to know some things that we don't know. All you have to do is look back 100 years and look at what we know now that we didn't know then. So I expect that they work by techniques about which we know nothing, but I should bring in something else. Einstein showed that as you get close to the speed of light, a billion kilometers an hour, roughly, time slows down for the things moving that fast. How much? Well, it depends on how fast you go. At 99.99% of the speed of light, and we make particles that go faster than that in accelerators, 99.999999. But at just 99.99% of the speed of light, you can go 37 light years in six months pilot time. You go out, come back, marry your grandchild's best friend, go out, come back, repeat the process. It's the gift of immortality. So people think Einstein is what limits us. It's quite the reverse. Now, one must be very, very careful about claims by astronomers who are pushing listening for radio signals but it'll say nobody's coming here because you can't get here from there. In the past, their calculations about spaceflight have been invariably seriously in error because it's an engineering problem and they don't know the details of the engineering. So nuclear fusion would be, would be very nice and it would do the job. But I think they know things that we don't know. Because even if they're only a thousand years ahead of us, just look back a hundred or a thousand years and say, uh, Things today are magic for yesterday. I have a digital wristwatch. Mm -hmm. Nobody could have duplicated that 70 years ago. Yeah. They know it kept time and it had a battery, but they couldn't have made another one because they couldn't analyze the chip. <coughs> so technology is something we have to be very careful about saying it's impossible. Every generation of ancient academics has thought it knew all there was to know and the next generation comes along and proves them wrong. Mm -hmm. You can't go faster than the speed of sound, they said during World War II. Well, not with a propeller-driven airplane, yeah. but we use jets. Yeah. Mr. Mosson, what you said, the message we got from them concerning the volcano, uh, so there was kind of a teaching. Huh? On May 19th, 1996, there was a meteorite coming to seven hours of impact with Earth. Not too many people talk about it. This is official. Yeah. It was discovered on May 15th, 1996, by two students uh, from the Arizona University in Tucson. And the government, this was a 2,000 meters in diameter meteorite. 
<coughs> we could do a thing. <coughs> Earth was exposed, civilization was going to be destroyed. And the governments kept quiet because they couldn't, they couldn't do so much. Then something happened. Something moved that object to impact Earth. Who did it? Why it happened? Nobody knows. That's why they produced two movies, Deep Impact and Armageddon, to prepare people in the future. After that event, the, all this uh, surveillance, all these uh, vigilantes around the Earth looking for meteorites got stronger and got more money because we learned how close we were to be destroyed. And that happened, and nobody learned about it. Were they who helped us? Uh, let me show you two more pictures. These were taken in Monterrey, Mexico. Uh, probably you don't remember in Europe, but we had a burning season, very strong burning season in the, in the beginning of 1998, uh, April and May, even uh, Florida in July. This object was recorded, or photographed, excuse me, over the uh, fire in, in Monterrey. This fire had been there for days. And in this second picture, we, have, we can see that the object is going away. After it went away, all the fires were finished. This had to do something with that? I don't know. No. But the coincidence is very amazing. <coughs> Yeah, so there, it, it looks like that they use a kind of te technology then also with which you can extinguish fires, right? So Absolutely, the, I looks, think it would be very like, easy like for that. them. So now concerning the, 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 their teaching, uh, uh, let's propose uh, that they, they teach us. I would like to ask you, Mr. Sitchin, uh, about your knowledge about the teaching of the primitive man. Well, uh, first of all, let me reiterate what I said at the uh, opening of this program, that according to the ancient peoples, and I think that the uh, present-day sightings, which are so numerous and so repetitious and so frequent, relatively, in, in historical terms, that uh, the, the comings and goings are not between our uh, speck of dust, which we call Earth in, in this small solar system, and some very distant solar system in some other uh, star system, but between another planet in our own solar system that comes into our vicinity roughly every 3,600 uh, years, as depicted on this uh, Sumerian seal, which shows uh, the complete the complete solar system, including the planets which we have discovered only in the past century and a half, and Pluto only in 1930, and one more planet that comes periodically between Mars and Jupiter when it is closest to us. And if you uh, examine the progress uh, between the very long, almost uh, two million years long, uh, situation that we call the Old Stone Age, the Paleolithic period, and then suddenly it moved to Mesolithic, to Neolithic, to Sumerian civilization. The pauses are all, always about 3,600 years, and in my very first book, The Twelfth Planet, I say it is as if an unseen hand came every 3,600 years, looked at us and said, okay, they are worthy of more knowledge, more civilization, let's give it to them. Now, whether this would happen if all these phenomena are a, uh, a precursor of what's about to, to happen, and you know there are all these prophecies about uh, whether the Maya prophecies or others about uh, the return, the return of the gods, and, and so on, whether uh, the next time that this return will happen, whether or not it will be a benevolent time, is not so easy to answer because one time, one time when that return had taken place and they looked at us, they decided to wipe us off the face of the earth. That was the time of the deluge, the great flood. So the assumption that they're always 
such nice guys, <laughs> and they always give us more civilization and more knowledge. May be true, it happened many times in the past, uh, or may not be true because once it did not work that way. It is interesting, uh, Guido, that uh, there are two versions uh, about the reasons for the decision to wipe mankind of the face of the earth during the flood. Uh, in the Bible, it says that the, uh, the God or the gods saw that man is evil. It did not turn out the way they intended it to turn out. So evil was one reason. In the Sumerian text, the reason it's given is overpopulation. There were too many overwhelming the earth. Now, unfortunately, uh, we have experienced great evils in our time, certainly during the 20th century. And there's no doubt that overpopulation is also a, a, a worrisome phenomenon from many respects. So uh, as, as one who has studied the ancient records, uh, if you ask me, uh, will it be again a benevolent visit, I say, I shrug, I don't know. Don't Let's know. hope so. Well, Thank there's you. something else that should be tossed out on the table here, and that is, for the first time in recent history, the beings on this planet, us, are really a threat to other civilizations in our local neighborhood. If there's one, I make one assumption about every advanced civilization able to travel between the stars, that is concerned about its own survival and security. That seems to be a natural tendency of all civilizations. At the end of World War II, any extraterrestrial policeman on the beat would recognize three things that would lead him to believe that soon, meaning less than 100 years, which is nothing on a cosmic time scale, this primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare, which is not a bad description of our society, <laughs> that soon we will be taking our brand of friendship, namely hostility, away from the planet. We're very good at killing, not very good at saving. The three obvious signs of this growth in technology supplanting anything that had been here in recent history. Nuclear weapons, powerful V2 rockets, and powerful radar. Three different areas of technology. You put them all together and you say within a hundred years we'll be going out. I don't think it's any coincidence at all that the only place in the world in July 1947 where you could study all three of these technologies was southeastern New Mexico. First nuclear weapon was tested there, White Sands Missile Range, the Trinity site. That was in 1945. That's where the captured German V2s were being fired. And that's where we had our best radar to track the rockets, which often didn't go where they were supposed to go. Now, I had an English astronomer say they could have gone to the Soviet Union. Sorry, they didn't test their first atomic bomb until August 1949, two years later. So from a different viewpoint, it's very unlikely that within, say, a 100-year time frame, any other civilization in the neighborhood is going through this transition from being stuck on its own planet to where it can bother somebody else. Either it's behind us or it's ahead of us. It doesn't take very long. Just look back at the last 100 years. From the Wright brothers to the space shuttle to the moon, uh, you know, very short time. So one could say that they are here to keep us from going out there. If you were an alien, would you want Earthlings out there with our sorry record? <laughs> so talking about good and evil, this is a planet which spends almost a trillion dollars a year on things military, military, and yet every single day of the year, at least 30,000 children die needlessly of preventable disease or starvation. Mm -hmm. Now, if that isn't a crazy mixed up planet, that. with its priorities way out of gear, then, uh, you know, I don't know anything. So it may well be that the 12th planet is out there and that they come stopping by from time to time. But I think at this moment in time, we're of concern to anybody else could, in the neighborhood. Could well be, could well be. In, if I may, yeah. uh, in this book, which just came out in Dutch, in English, Genesis Revisited, which is in, uh, in English a 1990 book, uh, I was the first one to draw attention and to provide photographs from what I call the Phobos incident. You know, there are 
quite a number of instances of spacecraft, uh, both American and uh, mostly Soviet, indeed. None, none of the Soviet spacecraft to Mars ever ended up <laughs> healthy and well. But in 1989, a Soviet spacecraft uh, called Phobos-2 they sent two spacecraft, Phobos-1, Phobos-2, in 1988. That's a satellite around Mars, Phobos. Yeah. Right. Uh, and named it after the satellite. And uh, the, the Phobos-1, they say, was lost uh, because one of their technicians leaned leaned on the console and pushed by mistake a button <laughs> and the, the spacecraft was lost, which is a, an unlikely story, but anyway. But Phobos 2 did, did make it to, to Mars, uh, sent for a while photos of uh, very enigmatic things from the surface of Mars, including what looks like a, the remains of a major city, uh, shown both in um, visual cameras and infrared. Then it showed the uh, what the, the Soviets said at the time was the shadow of a very elliptical object. And they said uh, on camera in a video uh, made with me, they said, well, some may want to call it flying saucers, your favorite term. <laughs> we don't say it, but some, some may want to call it. And then the, the spacecraft Phobos 2 was sent, diverted to its main mission, which was to fly in tandem 50 meters above the moonlet of Mars called Phobos. That's why the name Phobos II of the spacecraft. And the purpose was to bombard <coughs> Phobos, the moonlet, with laser beams in order to see what it is made of because based on the ratio between the size and the weight, it seems to be hollow. And there is a very perfect circular entrance leading into the middle of the moonlight. And then what looks like a missile was shot out at the Soviet spacecraft and it went into a spin and disappeared. Now, I have in this book the various photographs concerning with it, except the last one <coughs> of the missile being shot, which at that time I could not obtain, but a Soviet uh, uh, person connected to her husband with, with the space uh, program of the Soviets at the time, brought out to the West <coughs> that photograph, and it is available, and I'll show it in my uh, talk on Sunday. So. In my conclusion, and I'll show the ancient evidence is, is when, a, an ancient space base on Mars has been reactivated. And if we just want to take shots or learn the climate on Mars or find out if it had water once, okay. But if you want to bombard me with laser beams, that I'm not going to allow. So. There is apparently, if you put all these pieces together, uh, the warnings, the not the warnings, that something, something is cooking and somebody is watching what we are doing and to a certain extent wants us to find out. But up to a point, you can learn this much, but at this moment, not more than that. That is how it looks to me. Out of 24 <laughs> missions that have been sent to Mars, 14 have disappeared. The last two, Mars Polar Lander and Mars Climate Observer in 1999. Before that, Mar Mars Observer in 1993, that was a $1 billion probe and just disappeared. Uh, before that, uh, Phobos 1 in 1988 and Phobos 2 in March 1989. We have to remember that Mars was a planet very similar to Earth. It had oceans, atmosphere, and very and most probable life, as we have discovered in this meteorite that was found in 1984 and presented in 1996 by President Clinton. There is a second meteorite that was found with my microbes and bacteria fossilized. Uh, and this is the EETA 179001. Uh, and this one uh, also presents life, but uh, the antiquity, the, the age of this meteorite is just 600,000 years. Uh, 
The first one was 3,500 million old. And if you have the connection between these two dates, you have to accept that there, there was evolution between the two. And probably even to intelligent life, we have some photographs with this, the so-called face of Sidonia that NASA now is so busy trying to discredit and the pyramids on, on Mars. And uh, at the same time, we have lost so many probes that probably we can connect all these and accept that there is an intelligence interference. And I, I think that the key to solve this so-called mystery of uh, extraterrestrials and UFOs is going to come from Mars over the next 20 years. That is probably why, and this is pure speculation, why the intelligence uh, service in France are now telling us that we should be prepared for a contact or something over the next 15 years. In connection with what we are talking about, uh, I would like to ask you, Mr. Friedman, uh, so you wrote two books, Crash at Corona and Top uh, Secret Ma Magic. Um, so what we, what we learn here is that there seems to be some cover-up. They don't give us, give us the information which they have uh, concerning uh, those satellites going to Mars, and they don't give us uh, really the information what's going on. Well, first, uh, one of the things I'll talk about in my lecture on Sunday is the cosmic Watergate. It took me five years using the Freedom of Information Act and an appeal to get this very informative document from the CIA about UFOs. You can read eight Eight words on the page. <laughs> Five years to get that. Uh, now they've, they've gotten smarter in recent years because they don't like me showing that on television. They used whiteout. They had withheld 156 UFO documents for 16 years and they decided to release them. Unfortunately, they used whiteout instead of blackout, so you can still only read one sentence. This is from the National Security Agency. So there's no question we're dealing with the cosmic Watergate, and I will document that on Sunday. Uh, and it covers in a lot of areas the Roswell incident, and I was the original civilian investigator in that. They've come up with four explanations for what happened. The original press release, and there's no doubt about what they said, they said that we've recovered a flying saucer. I mean, what could be clearer than that from this Los Angeles newspaper? Los Angeles, not Roswell. This is from a major city. Army finds flying saucer. They already had the cover story in. So the second story, five hours later, was, oh, it's just a radar reflector from a weather balloon. Well, a few years back, that wasn't good enough. Congress asked for an investigation of an individual congressman. And then they said, oh, you know, we lied the second time around. It was really a super secret mogul balloon, which doesn't match any of the characteristics you understand. Then they came up with a fourth explanation. I'm waiting for number five. The fourth, oh, you know those stories of bodies? Those were crash test dummies, which we were dropping all over New Mexico. <laughs> and the kicker here is, and there are several, one, none of them were dropped until six years after Roswell. <laughs> so we have time-traveled crash test dummies. The second, I talked to the man who was in charge of that program, a retired colonel now. He wasn't retired back then. He said, look, for those tests to be meaningful, the dummies had to be the same size and weight as pilots, otherwise it'd be meaningless. They were six feet tall and they weighed 175 pounds and there's no way you can squish those down to little guys this big. Furthermore, if you look at the map that the Air Force published on where they dropped the crash test dummies, there were no drops near either location where the saucers came down. It was almost as if we were trying to be careful, make sure you don't drop one where the saucers crashed. So there's no question that there's a cover up. One might question why, whether we're trying to prevent the Soviets from learning what we learned from the technology of the saucers that were recovered, whether the politicians don't want to give up any power to a world government. After all, person in power wants to stay in power. That's one of the rules of our society, I think. And presidents come and go, but intelligence agencies go on forever. So uh, just as an example, just one quick thing. The director of central intelligence in the United States four years ago, after a lawsuit was brought, admitted that the total annual black budget, not under direct congressional control, for 
him was 26 billion US dollars. That covers the CIA, the NSA, the NRO, and the DIA. 26 billion dollars. So who knows what all they're covering up? You could spend your life reading all that stuff and you, you wouldn't finish it all. So for those who think people can't keep secrets, if you can keep secret what you're doing with $26 billion, you can keep a lot of secrets. Right. So now, um, concerning the, all the sightings in Mexico, nothing about all this you find in the American newspapers. No. And I, I think... It's the same with the Comita report. This came out in France last summer outstanding group of uh, political and military and scientists who spent three years looking at the UFO problem and concluded that we're probably dealing with extraterrestrials. Nothing in the American press about this. That tells you something about they're not doing their job. It's a cosmic water gate and as I said once, if the American press would spend 10% of the effort they spent on finding out about Monica Lewinsky <laughs> and finding out about flying saucers, it shouldn't take more than six months. There's not much chance of their doing that, you understand. <laughs> yeah. It looks like they want to keep us stupid. Is, uh, hasn't who, that who always is been? They, who is they? The government, our governments, or the uh, visitors? Yes, uh, okay, the yeah, visitors. That, that's another question to you right now, because now we come to the Anunnaki. Right. And uh, I would like to ask you about who were the Anunnaki, and it seemed that in the far past of uh, the history of humanity, they also tried to keep us stupid. Is that right, my... Uh, uh, Observation. Well, uh, yes and no, <laughs> which is uh, a good answer. Uh, no, the Anunnaki, first of all, which is a Sumerian term, uh, literally means those who from heaven to earth came. So people have to understand what it says. And uh, besides the text, uh, which anybody can read in, in any uh, textbook on, on Sumerian writings or go to a museum, the British Museum, the Louvre, wherever, and see the tablets. And uh, besides the text describing why they came and what they did here, I, I want really to point out, uh, Guido, since this is a television program, yes. <laughs> so it's a visual thing, uh, there are uh, depictions, pictorial depictions, of the Anunnaki, uh, one on Earth, one on Mars, and what to me is uh, definitely a spacecraft. I'll ask for this opportunity, the expert Friedman, does this look like a spacecraft? Could well be. Could well be. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, he's more definite, and I'm even more definite, and I hope uh, your viewers will form the, the, their own opinion. Uh, so, uh, this, there's no doubt, there's no doubt uh, in my mind, and anyone who would read any of, of my eight books, because they are filled with actual evidence, not with opinions, that Earth has been visited. Now, uh, when they came here <coughs> originally, about 450,000 years ago. They came for their own selfish reasons in need of gold. Gold not for coins or medallions or, uh, or for necklaces. Uh, you have something very interesting, by the way. Uh, but, but in order to protect the atmosphere on their own planet without which they could not have survived. Uh, at a certain point, about 300,000 years ago, they decided that they need manpower. They need somebody to do the work for them and created what the text called Lulu Amelu, a primitive worker, us, through genetic engineering. It was not until after the deluge, after the flood, that they decided that they need men as a partner on earth. Mm -hmm. Not just as a slave worker, but as a partner. And it is then that they started, as I mentioned before, to give us civilization every 3,600 years. Most of the knowledge that they conveyed to us was considered sacred, secret knowledge. It was not made public, you know, that anybody <laughs> could watch a program and, and find out everything. Only certain selected people, some of whom <coughs> were taken 
to that planet, which the Sumerians called Nibiru, meaning planet of the crossing. Its symbol was the cross, by the way. Uh, they took them to teach them, to give them that secret knowledge. So knowledge, uh, which, which we now call scientific knowledge, genetic knowledge, uh, the use of metals, uh, societal organization through priests and kings, etc., was very limited. And only at a certain time, at only at a certain time, was it begun to give this knowledge more publicly through the reading of some of the crucial texts on as part of the New Year festivals once a year. So knowledge was considered uh, a secret and a precious item of information. Incidentally, as far as the Anunnaki themselves were concerned, they kept all their knowledge on what the text called me. In English, we write it M-E. Nobody understands what it is, but it is said that, for example, the famous goddess Ishtar, who wanted to make her city a center of civilization, went to the, uh, to the Anunnaki, the god of knowledge, and connived to get out of him 100 of the mes, which are formulas, formulas for this knowledge, for that scientific information, for how to build high-rise buildings, uh, how to observe things astronomically. And she carried the whole 100 in one hand. Now, and I, I fully agree with uh, my colleague here, Friedman, that <coughs> We understand the Sumerian text, even I understand it applies to me too, in terms of our present technical knowledge. Uh, for example, if there is a depiction from ancient times of two astronauts saluting a rocket ship, if that would have been shown to me a hundred years ago, what does it depict? I would have said two bird-like people saluting a very large pencil. <laughs> and if somebody said, no, 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 it's not a pencil, it's a rocket, I would have said, what's a rocket? So, so our interpretation of the ancient knowledge is confined within the limits of our own technical knowledge. So now I would say these were computer chips. But maybe in 50 years or 10 years, the way it goes, now somebody say, computer chip, this is a micro something. So uh, knowledge was given uh, in tidbits, only to those found worthy of knowing it. And I think, I think that our advances now, which are very rapid, could not have happened unless somebody the Anunnaki uh, would have wanted it to happen. Right. I would like to go back to, to Mexico and uh, to the uh, Holy Mary appearances which took place all over the world and take more and more place uh, in, in this uh, century, in the last century. Mr. Monsan, you, do you know about the apparition of Holy Mary at Guadalupe? Yes. Yes. D would you be willing to, to tell the story? Yeah, well, in uh, 1531, uh, an Indian named uh, Juan Diego uh, was asked by the Virgin to, to build a little chapel or church, a house for her in Mexico. And he told this to the uh, Fray Juan de Sumarraga, the archbishop at that moment in Mexico. And he asked him for some proof. And then, according to the story, uh, the Virgin told Juan Diego to take some roses to Fray Juan de Sumaraga. And that was all he asked, and the Virgin said, that is all you have to do. And then he took the roses in a nichele, in a, in a little clothes, and when he presented the roses to, the, to Sumaraga, the roses fell, and then an image was formed in this piece of clothes. This clothes has survived for what, 469 years now, 68 years, that nobody has an explanation for that. Uh, 
we have found through analysis that there are uh, little reflections in the eyes of the Virgin. That's something really amazing because you can compare the, the pictures, the, the paintings we have from Sumaraga, and you can see what's the reflection in the eye of the Virgin and it's absolutely the same. It's like an old photograph, a photograph that was created so many 400, 500 years ago. The thing is why the Virgin appear and what happened at, after appear. What happened is that the, all the Indians converted to Catholicism and because of that, the Mexican people was safe. Otherwise, the Spaniards who had extinct the Mexicans uh, so long ago. Then, I don't know if this is an act of God or probably it's an act of from uh, some intelligence. I'm not connecting this to the extraterrestrials because I'm just speculating. But it seems that somebody thought that they, it had to do something to stop this killing and that's what's really happening. Uh, I am amazed because I've been able to watch the, the eyes of the Virgin with big lenses, I mean incredible lenses, this is so close and this is very difficult to get to, to get this permission. And I have found, and excuse me, what I have found that the eyes look like if they are alive. And I can tell you this after having my personal experience, otherwise I wouldn't believe it. I would say probably it's a painting. For so long I thought well, that was a painting, a, a fake story. At this moment, I really think there is something behind that, that uh, virgin. And remember that in, 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 in Yugoslavia, uh, when, uh, the, this virgin that has been appearing has been telling many people I appear here, but I live in Mexico. And it seems <laughs> that the, this connection of the house or the chapel that was built to the Virgin, this is still true. And for some reason, there is a presence uh, around this miracle. I don't have a really an explanation. Uh, I, I want to learn more about it. I am investigating investigating this and I don't give uh, final conclusions on this. Like I said uh, before, uh, Alan Hynek and uh, Jacques Vallée in, this, in the book uh, on, the, on the Eyes of Reality, they say that the uh, Holy Mary appearances could have to do with also the UFO energy. Yes. And uh, so uh, I know about many miracles having happened there because oh, yeah. people uh, yeah. uh, have touched the, the, the... Well, they touched this image for 200, 300 years with bare hands, yeah. okay? Nothing happened to it. They have made experiments with this same kind of uh, clothes, or I don't know how you call this in English, Ishtle is called in Mexico. And after 20 years, it's completely gone. Many times they have done that. Yeah. Completely gone, the, the bacteria and other things destroy and decay, you know, the, the, the clothes. And this has survived for so long that there is no explanation. And, and after it was exposed, remember Mexico was in the middle of a lake, there was a salty waters, and these salty waters destroyed almost everything, you know? And nothing happened to this. It didn't have a glass for almost 350 years, and it still is the same. You can still watch completely the, the, this image, and uh, we have to accept there is something that we don't understand there yet. I would like to ask you a, a question, <coughs> because I, I showed to you yes. a, a medallion, which uh, I got I have two of the same, a medallion of the appearance of Holy Mary in Paris at the Rue du Bac in the 19th century, and <coughs> there she appeared to a nun in a monastery, and um, so on this medallion you see a Holy Mary on the globe surrounded by 12 stars and you said that this image looks similar like <coughs> something you know from from history. Yes, well first of all the, the number 12 is of course significant and uh, explains the, the sanctity or the importance in ancient times of 12 because the 12th member of the solar system. So you have, uh, of course, the, the 12 months. A day was divided into 12 double hours. There are the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles of Jesus. So it was uh, a celestial connotation. And uh, 
the the ancient depiction which this uh, reminded me of also has the image of uh, in that case not of the Virgin Mary but of the goddess Ishtar mm -hmm. uh, surrounded by the 12 celestial symbols which is the number 12 so uh, does the notion of some female female sacred person appearing uh, signifying things uh, indicating that that uh, something <laughs> good or bad probably the people hope good uh, will happen uh, translated into images of the virgin mary in christianity or catholicism i'm no expert on that but uh, that that the roots the roots of this female each, uh, image surrounded by uh, 12 celestial symbols does go back to antiquity. I would like to ask you one more question and a um, qu question for, for all of us. What is the relationship between the alphabet <coughs> and the DNA? Well, this is the subject of my latest book, and not yet translated into Dutch, called The Cosmic Code. Uh, and it deals with the uh, use of uh, of DNA, not only for uh, uh, for genetic purposes, but also for encoding, for transmitting the secret information about uh, which you ask me, and uh, this was manifested at the time of the the the, the largest ever recorded uh, even Mexico City <laughs> excluded uh, recorded of a UFO sighting took place in the Sinai. Uh, when uh, God uh, landed in his uh, celestial vehicle on top of Mount Sinai in front of 600,000 people. And it was at that time that the Hebrew alphabet was devised. The Hebrew alphabet, unlike any other alphabet, consists of 22 letters, which is the number of our chromosomes without the two sex chromosomes, which is another story that dealt with in my books. And like the DNA, where all the uh, chemical compositions that lead to proteins, etc., are based on three DNA letters out of the four, three. It's always three, three, three. The Hebrew language uses always three letters to construct the complete Hebrew language. So the Hebrew alphabet specifically, or the one devised in the Sinai Peninsula, where the oldest examples of alphabetical use were found around 1450 BC. In my opinion, as I relate, no, not in Divine Encounters, in the Cosmic Code, right? right uh, definitely are connected. That was one way of transmitting the sacred, the divine knowledge to the chosen people. Is there something, maybe Mr. Mossam, Mr. Friedman, Mr. Sitchin, which you would like to add before we say goodbye? Yes, uh, we are in front of one of the most important events in history of mankind. We should uh, not accept this uh, blindly, you know. We should be very skeptical, but at the same time to have an open mind, because it's probably truth. We cannot defy and we cannot, say, we cannot deny that this is happening just to, to deny it. We have to, to confront and investigate. If we want to prove it, we have to investigate. If we want to, to finish with this, we have to investigate. Because it seems there are so many who are content just with what others are saying, pro or against this phenomenon, that now is the time to be really scientists uh, and try to have an answer for this. Because this is related to the future. That's what is more important for me. Because as I said at the beginning, with this presence here, we know that we are going to do the same in the future, even though we are savages at this moment, probably we would be mature very soon and we would be able to, to travel to other planets. Just imagine for a moment the future of mankind in that possibility, how long we could live, uh, how many things we could do. I think we would have the chance to be closer to God and that's what it's all it means. Uh, I hope uh, that the message here is uh, that we have to do something for Earth at this moment 
because Earth is in big danger. The ozone layer depletion, the climate change, the warming of the planet, the uh, overpopulation, the extinction of, of animals and plants, all that is happening. And if it continues, we are going to stop this dream from the next generations. And I don't think we have that right. I hope that with, the, with this phenomenon, we would be motivated to see the future and try to do something for those who haven't been born. Maybe the stopping of the cars because of UFO energy is also a message, a warning to us, stop polluting your atmosphere. Uh, Mr. Friedman, is there something you would like to say? Yeah, I think the best hope for a decent future for mankind is an earthling orientation. To stop thinking of ourselves as Greek, Chinese, uh, Canadian, uh, Peruvian, whatever. We all are earthlings. I think the best way to recognize that is to realize that there are beings coming here from someplace else. And to them, we all are earthlings. And I think perhaps if we play our cards right, and create a planet that is indeed suitable for intelligent life, we haven't done a great job so far, I think that we can qualify for admission to the cosmic kindergarten. Uh, in a bad day, I'd say cosmic preschool. But I think where this fits into the picture is recognition that we've gone astray, as some people would put it. We need to use our technology for the benefit of mankind, not for killing other people. And that's the important lesson here, is this gives us a mirror. How do we look to them, a primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare? Is that the kind of legacy we want to give our grandchildren? I don't think so. Thank you. Mr. Sitchin. Well, I'm <laughs> very brief. Uh, one uh, conclusion is that <clears throat> the UFO phenomenon is not a new or modern phenomenon. Second, it is a part of the uh, evidence for our being not alone in our own solar system. Uh, and three, that uh, if we want to know our future, we should study the past. I hope that this communication of today uh, will help to make the big step in our evolution. Thank you very much Thank for you. being here. Thanks for having us.